testing is actually somewhat problematic uh, because clinical testing with MRI, visual fields, uh, ERG, uh, EOG, um, that's uh, electroretinography and uh, electrooculography, uh, and uh, it really don't show anything. Now, if you want to show something, you really need to use research grade uh, functional MRI. Uh, or alternatively, complex uh, EEG paradigms that let you look at network dysfunction. And to give you uh, the best example before I come back to what we do, uh, if you look at a public transport network in a large city, uh, where I am we have trams or what Americans call trolleys, um, we have uh, buses, we have trains uh, spread across the city. And theoretically, they interact. Frequently, they don't uh, interact perfectly. And this manifests as somebody getting onto a, a train at point A and subsequently getting off uh, at their final destination, either on time, early, or delayed. Now, at any time, the delay can be produced by an interaction of the various networks. Okay, so if the... Uh, tram gets into the uh, station late, you miss your train. If the bus uh, is early, as they sometimes very rarely do, um, you get an earlier train. So it's networks. Well, the brain works on the principle of networks, and we've always considered it to be nodes. We think of visual area, we think of motor area, we think of speech area, etc. And those things have to be connected up. If those networks are not functioning properly, uh, then um, essentially uh, our overall function is impaired. And almost any disease process can produce an abnormality. And depending on the process, there may be characteristic abnormalities or just abnormalities that you can measure over time that will tell you whether or not there's progression or change. We decided that the better way of looking at the brain rather than the conventional clinical examination, which, as I was saying before, was designed in 1873, uh, so we're currently just gone past the sesquicentennial of uh, the clinical examination. Uh, essentially, we felt, felt we could look at it better by looking at input into the brain and measuring output. Now, the first sensory motor system to develop in mammals is, in fact, the, the visual motor sensory system, and we move our eyes in order to maintain vision. So they're, they're inextricably linked. So what we do is give people instructions uh, on uh, what to look at and we change the way the targets move and we change their mindset. And to give you a, an, an example of that, uh, a simple example is that if I'm walking down the street uh, and uh, a person is walking towards me, I look at the person and might subsequently uh, look away from them or whatever. Now... If that person happens to be an attractive woman, I might spend more time looking at her. If my wife is walking next to me, I might look away from her. Okay. Now, if uh, uh, to add another element of complexity, I happen to be hungry, which, as you can tell, might happen to me fairly frequently, uh, and that woman's carrying a chocolate cake, despite her attraction, I might look at the chocolate cake because that's what my attention is uh, seeking. Now, the other issue is that I just looked at that woman and I thought she was attractive. My wife looked at her and said, did you see that handbag with those shoes and that nail polish? So she's looked at completely different things to what I've looked at. So the way our brain functions and what we look at, where we look, how we look, and how we look away is determined by complex brain function. We change those instruction sets. You have to go back to understanding how the brain develops again, uh, as, as uh, we discussed before, and that is that we developed hardwired uh, um, connections uh, over the first year or so, and the, and the brain is absolutely solid. But function changes, and function changes on the basis of the selection of inputs into each cell. And you develop preferential networks that interact. So it, 
we learn on the basis of experience. The best example for this happens to be the visual system. The first time you open your eyes, you've got uh, 130 million receptors in each eye that is blasted with light. That has no form, no structure, because there is no comprehension of, how, uh, of what the world should look like. So we are actually blind when we're born, except now it's all bright rather than dark. So what happens is that that information, that visual information is transferred to an area of the brain called the thalamus, and then from the thalamus back to the visual cortex. So the information then goes from the visual cortex to what's called association cortex, and then it feeds back onto different parts of the thalamus that have an inhibitory effect on the main pathway. So the best analogy is noise reduction headphones. What happens is you progressively start to filter out the noise and the world takes on structure. Now, on top of that, we actually can't see in real time. We have 130 million receptors in each eye. We have 140 million cells at the back of the brain. And we actually only have uh, 1.2 million uh, nerve uh, cells in the optic nerve. So you can, clearly, you can't see the world in real time. And if anybody closes their eyes and then opens them, there's about a 40 millisecond blank spell when you don't see anything. And what's happening is that you're filling up the memory buffers of what the visual world looks like. Moreover, when I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, everything's in color. But over 98% of all our color receptors are in the central five degrees of a vision. So why am I seeing the whole world in color? It's because my brain has colored it in, having looked around and uh, ascribed colors to everything. And what we're doing all the time is updating our, our visual uh, image, okay? In the same way that we, when we back up our computer, we only back up the bits and pieces that have changed. Now, the reason for going through all of that is there's an incredible amount of computing power involved in this. And uh, to put it bluntly, as my PhD supervisor said to me, um, the brain works on the principle of sloppy workmanship. Near enough is good enough. So we allow for a lot of things and we filter out the imperfections. It's only when those imperfections reach a certain level that we become aware of them. Now the filtering system and the memory storage system and uh, the processing system seem to be impaired in visual snow syndrome relative to what we consider normal. And it's important to remember that it is a spectrum of function rather than a spectrum of disorder. In the same way that some people can run fast, some people can run long distances, and then there's a lot of people who really prefer not to run at all. You know, Francesca's been doing some, some wonderful work uh, and they are looking at biomarkers and I'm fully aware of that. Biomarkers essentially uh, identify uh, specific abnormalities. That's, that's why they're called biomarkers. So uh, in a system that's as diffuse as the brain, uh, there are a number of symptoms that can be produced in a number of ways. Uh, if you take visual snow syndrome as such, and you can identify uh, biomarker abnormalities, then you can actually filter out people who have a particular brand of visual snow syndrome as opposed to, to people who have uh, symptoms that mimic visual snow syndrome. So that uh, you can then, uh, you may or may not be able to use those biomarkers uh, as uh, markers of therapy uh, but you should be able to use them as uh, markers of identification. Uh, and that, that is incredibly value, uh, valuable. I, I suspect there probably is a genetic predisposition, but very little. It's, uh, there's a lot to suggest that it's experiential, that you learn, you learn to see, and therefore you learn to see as well as you need to see. Uh, and therefore, if you can teach people to see uh, better, 
uh, or suppress the symptoms, then you have the potential for developing, inverted commas, a cure for visual snow. Now, that's where visual snow syndrome has uh, been so interesting and, and, uh, in that uh, it's actually representative of a number of, of separate disorders that are abnormalities of process. So the question uh, that, that we will come to is how do we affect processing? And um, there's been some very interesting work, as you're well aware, by Sui Wong uh, in the UK uh, on mindfulness. And there's quite a lot of evidence in the literature about the effect that mindfulness has on central connectivity and processing. So the answer is, I think everything's pointing us towards uh, that at least as something to try. We, we live in a hardwired world, okay? But we're more talking about uh, the way a computer program works. Okay, now it's connected to the hardwired world. It's dependent on the hardwired world. It's dependent on its internal hardwiring. However, it all comes to a screeching halt if the, uh, if the program becomes corrupt in any way, shape or form. So here I think we're dealing with the program not the hard wiring. Now that's not to say that changes in hard wiring might not uh, produce uh, abnormalities or make people more susceptible to abnormalities. But in the long run, I think it's the program. Everything we have done on patients with true visual snow syndrome suggests that their brain is structurally identical uh, to everybody else in the community. Okay, and that's uh, and, and that their function uh, in terms of visual acuity, visual fields, ERG, EOG, uh, all normal. However, if we look at physiological function or we look at functional MRI, which tells you how the brain is communicating within itself, they're, they're abnormal, and that suggests that the programming is abnormal. Rebooting the brain is not considered um, a viable prospect at the moment. You and I both know that if our computer's not working, if all else fails, we withdraw the power, we turn it off. Um, however, uh, it's also possible uh, to rewrite a program or to debug a program. And I suspect that it is possible to debug uh, biological processes as well, uh, and finding techniques for doing that uh, are, uh, have always been the difficulty. Uh, neurology in general terms has concentrated on uh, the motor system. <clears throat> we have somebody who has a stroke, uh, and we can rehabilitate them so that you can hardly tell that they were paralyzed. Um, now, if you think on the sensory side, We've developed very few therapies for fixing impaired vision, taste, smell, touch, etc. Hearing, you know, very few. Uh, and it's a, it's a matter of therapeutic technique, I think, rather than anything else. And as uh, I've alluded to in the past, there are some developing therapies uh, that are coming, and they're based on solid science uh, with techniques called mindfulness, which for want of a better term uh, are, are developments of, of uh, meditation. Okay, now we know, for instance, that uh, Indian yogis can lie on a bed of nails and feel so no pain. Why? Because they've retrained their pain, their, their brain, to say that those little print pricks are not actually going to damage my skin, and therefore I'm going to ignore the sensation from them. Uh, there are other elements as well. And we know that, uh, for instance, uh, in people who are deep in prayer, uh, that we see a change in uh, EEG patterns, etc. So you can modify the way the brain works. Uh, the, so if we, you apply mindfulness techniques to people, 
you can actually modify connectivity within the brain, and this has been looked at in, in rehabilitation of various forms. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something we might discuss later, but there has been specific work in, uh, in visual snow that looks very promising.